Welcome to the first installment of the long-awaited revisioning series uh, on the future of Santa Fe style. I'm Anthony Guida, president of uh, Friends of Architecture Santa Fe. I'll be your tour guide today, um, along with my architect colleague, Charlotte McKernan, um, and some members of our board. And this is a Friends of Architecture event. Our events are designed to be provocative, participatory, and largely informal. You are invited and in fact encouraged um, to engage in dialogue with us, to ask questions, to provide feedback as we go. If there's questions in the slide presentation, please you know, raise your hand and, and ask a question as we go along. Does that sound good? Okay, that's the rules of engagement. So uh, you may know this from reading some of the advanced copy on this. This is not just a kind of nice, polite architectural history walking tour uh, that you're on. Uh, we have a bit of an ax to grind. Um, our, with, certainly with the series, our contention with the revisioning series is that, you know, now in its 12th decade, the Santa Fe style experiment in urbanism, in architecture and more, um, has become a victim of its own success in accomplishing the stated goals of promoting tourism and economic development. The regulations we've placed on our shared built environment, um, have very near completely gentrified our historic districts, uh, precluded good design and the further evolution of our regional style, uh, excluded the density, diversity of uses, the people, and the types of cultural expression that sustain a vibrant urban environment for its residents, um, and are depriving the public of change uh, and a future that is different from a static present uh, or an imagined past. Um, I think that's why Malord's poster rings as true today as it did 35 years ago. Um, we're going to talk more about this today, but that's kind of the background uh, and the point of view of the series. I think, you know, we've talked a lot uh, as a group, as a board, that you know, it really didn't start out that way. This is a clipping on the screen from the November 1912 Santa Fe, New Mexican. It's an article on the new old Santa Fe exhibit, um, which we'll talk about. Uh, in some depth today. The exhibit was just about to open um, and ultimately would be successful in promoting a wide ranging city plan of proposed buildings, parks, and public infrastructure improvements, and, and also a new architectural style um, suitable for future growth that would complement the prized historic character of the city. The copy and the highlighted portion in particular speaks of a new epoch um, of growth, of dreaming, and of blazing a trail. It dismisses prescription. It's optimistic towards the prospects of change and the future. Our idea and our aim with the revision series is that we might be able to recapture this enthusiasm for, uh, uh, for the future of our shared uh, urban environment and use design and policy that reflects our current values uh, and responses to our current challenges rather than those of the past. To get there, uh, we want to explore the history of Santa Fe through a very specific lens from the perspective of what the city's future looked like during specific periods of its development. Um, these are the goggles that we're asking you to put on today. So in the first few sessions of the series, we're going to ask you to come back in time with us um, to see then new buildings, then new developments, then new innovations in their actual context and critically assess why things might have been done in a certain way, whether or not they worked out, um, and what the alternatives could have been. Um, and this is all to kind of reflect then on uh, what Heather mentioned just a moment ago, the current um, uh, project in, in the city to develop, to revisit city planning uh, and general plan for the city, um, as well as the ongoing effort to update our land use development code. So this, this is a kind of right moment for for a lot of this. These are the four sessions that we've announced. You know, we're in session number one today, invention. Uh, the period, roughly speaking, is 1912 to, to the Second World War. Um, we're going to talk about buildings in Santa Fe in that context today. Uh, it's the inception of the Santa Fe style. It's the beginning of, uh, of a new era um, in Santa Fe in terms of architecture and urban design. Um, in the second series, we'll look at the evolution of our regional style. Maybe we'll look at buildings that may have uh, fallen off a lot of people's radar, buildings both before and after the 1957 ordinance, style control ordinance, um, and talk about 
uh, the, uh, the context of those evolutions and innovations. Uh, we'll then have a session um, which will most likely be a panel discussion uh, about the current state of affairs, um, it'll focus heavily on preservation the last 30 years. Um, and then we're gonna invite you to be part of a design charrette um, in the fall uh, that will look at uh, the moment that we're now in, um, the future of Santa Fe style and whether um, the, uh, the project of style um, has anything to do with solving the problems for the future. Uh, look for dates to be announced, um, particularly on the bike tour, because that's coming up soon. Okay, a few questions before we go on. A few ideas that we'll track and discuss more today. The Santa Fe style is an invention of the 20th century. It's a calculated response to the problems of cities then declining fortunes and population, and to the problem of developing a new regional identity as an American state. It was a clever idea and it really worked. Santa Fe style isn't a direct or inevitable progression of local styles and, or building traditions. Uh, although it's embraced here in Santa Fe, the main uh, regional revival style that Santa Fe is best known for wasn't invented here um, and was also used to address similar new priorities throughout the Southwest. We'll talk about that some. Uh, and then lastly, the Santa Fe style is an umbrella, we're using the Santa Fe style as an umbrella term uh, that encompasses a number of revival styles associated with the American Southwest region, including Pueblo revival, Spanish Pueblo revival, um, and eventually territorial revival, among others. Revival styles are historicist, uh, but not necessarily historical. In context, there are new design expressions that intentionally echo a past or a previous architectural era or a present application. Any questions about that kind of historical, historicist uh, distinction? All right, so uh, before we get into the future, at least how it looked maybe in 1912, let's just talk a little bit about Santa Fe in the 19th, 19th century for context. I think, you know, before we get to the images of the physical built environment, we know uh, the rough contours of the era, 1821, Mexican independence ends more than two centuries of Spanish colonial rule. Santa Fe Trail opens, bringing trade and Americans. Um, 1846, Santa Fe is occupied by the U.S., and two years later, New Mexico becomes the territory of the United States. Um, 1861 to 65 is the U.S. Civil War. 1880, the railroad comes into Santa Fe. And then there's a long road to statehood that ends in 1912. Uh, okay, so photo of the plaza looking east in 1866. Question for the group. Can we spot the gentrification? You know, by the 1860s, uh, again, in the territorial period, this is just after the Civil War, um, the Santa Fe, the city of Santa Fe had begun a major transformation in its appearance. Right. Commercial buildings around the plaza are by this time largely owned by Anglo businesses. Wooden sidewalks were, were installed and then quickly replaced with flagstone sidewalks um, as improvements that supported business. Rustic portals were torn down and then reconstructed in a relatively primitive um, uh, Greek revival style. We see that um, you know, in these buildings on the left, you know, where we have sawn um, columns and wood fascias and they're painted. Um, Stucco's painted white. Um, this is a nod to Greek revival in the east. You could see one unimproved portal with the corbels and, and the old Vigo columns. The unpaved dirt plaza is reimagined in this era also as a park with radio paths and its fence to keep animals out. Also in the photo, we can see uh, La Parroquia, the, the, the St. Francis Church, old one that was built in the 1700s before the new uh, cathedral was uh, constructed around it. Uh, and then, of course, there's the bandstand in the center of the, uh, the plaza, which gets moved like a year later um, for the obelisk. Quick look at this Greek revival uh, overlay in Santa Fe, where the you know the kind of emergence of territorial period architecture, not territorial revival. And this is the real thing. So you know these Spanish colonial buildings were kind of overlaid with or improved with. Sawn lumber details, square columns, spacious window casings, pediments, again, emulating Greek revival style, popular in the East, actually waning in popularity in the East by the late um, 19th century or the second half of the 19th century. There's sash windows um, and bricks that come over the Santa Fe Trail. 
Uh, they're applied to existing buildings. The prized bricks are used at the top of the parapets uh, to reduce erosion uh, of mud stucco and emulate a Greek key cornice. This is a very interesting set of images to look at. They're spaced apart by perhaps less than 20 years. Um, on the left, uh, San Francisco Street, or the plaza looking east um, in 1870s. On the right, same location really, looking west uh, in the 1890s. Um, I think, you know, what was a territorial plaza now becomes, um, after the railroad comes in, uh, uh, there's an influx of, um, of then popular revival styles to go nationally. Um, Second Empire, Italianate, uh, these are done with modern materials. They're done with brick masonry. They're built with cast iron. They have plate glass windows. Portals come down. The plaza begins to suggest the main streets of other American cities. In fact, the south side of the plaza looked a lot like this into the late 1950s, early 90s. This is an 1882 aerial map of Santa Fe. And some of you no doubt have seen this before. It seems to be more about projecting a vision of an American future than describing the town as it was. There's an emphasis on new buildings in Santa Fe with pitched roofs, with white facades. The new cathedral is depicted, but it's not yet actually finished, of course. The railroad comes in at the lower right. We can even see the new um, Santa Fe depot. It's built in the California mission style, mission revival style. There's still the challenge in 1882 of how do I get from the rail terminus to the central business district? Um, there's not a kind of really defined way to come across the river um, or coherent way of coming across the river um, and into downtown where the actual hotels are. This really isn't a portrait of the oldest capital city in the country, is it? Um, or, or a city with a deep Spanish colonial past. Map really kind of belies the facts on the ground, right? So. Um, the photos um, that we saw previously around the plaza, um, you know, really are quite different than, you know, what the rest of the city looked like. Uh, absence of paved roads, of sewer, of gas, electric, ponderance of old mud adobes, narrow winding dirt streets, um, and an uncomfortable existence with the new Anglo buildings, technologies, and economic demands of fabric fuel. These are the kind of challenges at the very end of the 19th century. And the challenges that inform a kind of thinking about the future from that particular point of view. You know, Santa Fe is now an American city, but you know, it has some additional baggage um, that, uh, that, that's specific to this place. In terms of how we think about the American city or the future of the American city in the late 19th century, I want to take a slight detour um, to the Chicago World's Fair of 1893, the World's Columbian Exhibition. The neoclassical white city that was the center of the fair, you know, and this is an enormously influential development. Tons of people visit. This is about the new American century. This is about the expansion into the West and all of that. The white city um, that was the center of the fair was influential in spawning the City Beautiful movement. Uh, and the accompanying notion that the physical form of a modern city could be more than a symbol of its commercial or industrial progress, right? I think that's what the 1882 map was trying to convey, like, hey, we're, we're modern, we're up to date. Um, that, you know, even beyond that, there was a way to think about the urban environment, um, its architecture, its planning, uh, that could create visual order, elevate the life of its citizens, and even inject a bit of fantasy into everyday lives. This is the Emerald City of Alfred Fahm's Oz books quite literally. Um, the choice of neoclassicism, revival style based on Greek and Roman antiquity was deliberate and connected the contemporary, connected to contemporary archeological investigations in, in the West, associations um, with, uh, with centuries of Western culture and empire. Because this is a compelling exercise in identity for a young and newly expanded nation. It's also, of course, a reaction to industrialization, particularly the utilitarian urban forms of Western cities and towns, like railroads and all that, but also like things about Chicago, trains, slaughterhouses, and the kind of the emerging new technology of steel frame. It's quite a different vision. At the fair, there also existed the Midway, um, you know, which was an expansive jumble of kind of 3D stage sets, uh, kind of imperialistic objectification of other cultures and their inhabitants. 
Um, these were facsimiles of settings from all around the globe, Turkish bazaars, Chinese markets, Pacific Island villages, and they often um, put on display uh, the natives of these places uh, for the purposes of tourist consumption and fascination. These might be the curious locales that are outside the Emerald City um, in the land of Oz. And Walt Disney World. Yeah, totally that, right? Okay, so that's context. Back to Santa Fe. We know there are some problems. We talked about some of the physical problems that emerged at the end of the 18, or the 1800s. The big thing is really that the, the railroad failed to deliver the economic prosperity that was hoped for. Um, some of that has to do with the idea of it being a spur and not being on the main line, but there's a population decline. Between 1880, when the railroad comes in, um, and 1910, the population reduces from 6,600 to 5,000 people. So pretty much a 20% loss in population in 20 years. Not a big town either. There were obviously quite a bit of concern. We're going to talk today about the new old Santa Fe exhibition in 1912 uh, that we referenced earlier. Um, it really was a watershed moment. Um, it's an effort that brought together art, architecture, planning, and a whole lot of marketing to reverse these downward trends by promoting the city's unique ancient character, inventing a style of architecture visually compatible with the old while accommodating new functions, um, and remaking the city um, in a version of its own image, largely for tourist consumption. Interestingly, this effort was not led necessarily by politicians, attorneys, or businessmen, um, but by leaders in the fields uh, and study of art and culture. Meet the gang. From left to right, and we talk about this this group, but these are this is a group of mostly archaeologists that are associated uh, with the School of American Archaeology in Santa Fe, uh, led by Edgar Hewitt, um, American archaeologist, anthropologist. His focus is Native American cultures of the Southwest, notably um, focus on Bandelier and the Chaco sites. Um, he's the father of the Antiquities Act of 1906. I'm director of the School for American uh, Archaeology. Uh, and he's the founder and first director of the New Mexico Museum. Jesse Nussbaum, American archaeologist, anthropologist, photographer. He's Hewitt's first employee. He's the first archaeologist hired by the National Park Service era, ever. He's later the superintendent at Mesa Verde National Park, um, and he ultimately becomes the director of the Laboratory of Anthropology here in Santa Fe up on Museum Hill. Elenis Morley, American archaeologist. He's, his focus is Mesoamerica and the and Mayan culture. He worked under Hewitt um, here. He was a big, uh, along with Nussbaum, um, he helped organize the new old Santa Fe exhibition. And he's a major uh, enthusiast for the Santa Fe style. Also looks a bit like Indiana Jones because he may have contributed to that, that character. Um, Kenneth Chapman, uh, American art historian, anthropologist, illustrator, researcher. He's Hewitt's number two at the museum. He's a champion of Potter's Maria and Julian Martinez from San Alfonso. Um, he also works with the next guy, Carlos Vieira. Vieira is an American painter, illustrator, and photographer of Portuguese descent. He's one of the first members of the Santa Fe art colony in the early 20th century. He's a preservation advocate. He's an early advocate for Pueblo revival style, and he did the paintings or led the, the effort to do the paintings in this very room. None of these men were from here. All were, you know, from back east, more or less. Um, you know, and totally men of their era with all of the biases and blind spots that come with that. And we'll talk some about this today for sure. But this is the group that's most instrumental in kicking off the Santa Fe style experiment. And it's that, that activity happens around the museum. It ha happens around, um, uh, and, and, and it's, it's this show of 1912. Um, this is also their, you know, why they're out here, right? They're probably, I would say undoubtedly less interested in European archaeology and, and, you know, and that which is you know, part of the ivory tower of that field uh, back east uh, and in Europe. Um, they're making a case for the archaeology of the American Southwest, you know, in Nussbaum's photographs of the period, a kind of a definite romantic fascination uh, with the Pueblo ruins, um, with the continuity of uh, traditional indigenous craft. Note the appearance of Cliff Palace at this time, 
the palace no longer look like this. This is before the stabilization um, and reconstruction that, that happened there and in a lot of other um, Pueblo sites or ancient Pueblo sites throughout the Southwest. In the first decade of the 20th century, the School for American Archaeology, the New Mexico Museum, they're housed next door in the Palace of the Governors, most prominent building, a public building in Santa Fe. Uh, what it looked like on the left, there was a, 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 a kind of Victorian elaborate portal um, that was added at some point in the 19th century. It replaced the kind of simpler territorial version along the lines of the 1860s photographs that we're looking at. Um, that was a look um, at the turn of the century. The museum archaeologists that we just met um, in 1909 began a project to uh, restore the Palace of the Governor's Port Hall. Um, it is, and it's what we have today, a purely speculative design. There's no photos, no, no real convincing evidence existed of the palace appearing this way during the Spanish period. Put together a 10-foot long model. That's one of the exhibits in 1912 at the new old Santa Fe exhibit. It's an example uh, of the style, um, but only a little bit, right? This is still in their mind a restoration or a reconstruction. Think about that the palace example. If they're doing the same thing in these ancient sites as they're proposing here, this it's kind of an interesting approach uh, and very different from our current approach to preservation. Lee, Sylvanus Morley, you know, completes a house next to the Scottish Rite, uh, the Roque Lobato uh, house um, that has kind of similar proportions, very classical, lots of symmetry, you know, and pavilions, right? A lot, very similar to the kind of classic proportions of the White City um, at the Chicago World's Fair, but just through, through the kind of Santa Fe route. We'll see this in the in the discussion of this building, but there's a classicism to the reconstruction of the portal here. Uh, also on display is the 1912 plan. Uh, a planning board had been formed uh, in the space of five months. It developed a comprehensive city plan based on the principles of the City Beautiful movement, which is quite remarkable. It's a city of 5,000 people, three years after Chicago does its City Beautiful plan, that one is developed here in the space of five months. Uh, Hewitt and Morley are on this board. Uh, there are other prominent Santa Fe's that are on this board. They develop this, they get it approved. The plan proposes a wide range of improvements uh, to expand the city fabric, improve um, aspects of it in a logical fashion, some of which were realized, some of which were not. There's along the river, and it's hard to make out because it's mostly dotted, there's a proposal for parks, there's a proposal for it to be a kind of grand boulevard with a street on either side of the river. Just a little vestige of this is that weird part of East Alameda that's behind the compound dirt road. That's like the portion that was built. Other things did stick, right? So it's more than just physical things. There are kind of cultural things, uh, renaming the streets uh, to have Spanish names as they do now, that we know now. There's also the notion that new buildings on ancient streets should be in the complementary new Santa Fe style. Uh, this was far more about continuity and appearance necessarily than preservation, um, as there was no specific discouragement of demolition or remodels of those ancient streets. Just that the new stuff would kind of look good with the old stuff. Um, there's a a little quote here too that you know that the the flyer for the um, for the exhibit you know said the goals are twofold to awaken local interest in the preservation of old Santa Fe and the development of the new along lines along the lines most appropriate to this country country around here um, to advertise the unique and unrivaled possibilities of the city as the tourist center of the Southwest very explicit. This is also the moment in this exhibition and with this plan that, you know, the, the Santa Fe has given its nickname, not the city beautiful, but the city distant. Uh, and there's also, I haven't been able to kind of pin this down exactly where, but either at, with the exhibition or shortly thereafter, there's a, uh, a, a proposed design competition to look at, okay, we have this new style. What are the houses that we're going to build 
going to look like? What are the houses that are modern, that have central heating, that have garages and kitchens and bathrooms? What do they look like in this style? We know what the existing, you know, Adobe structures look like. So what would, what would modern houses? And what would they not look like? And what would they not look like? Also shown at the exhibit. And again, we're saying like, they're saying, hey, there's a new Santa Fe style that we're proposing. None of it existed in Santa Fe just yet, right? <laughs> so there was the restoration of the, of, the, of the portal, which was under construction. So these guys were very much looking for examples, right? So Jesse Nussbaum has a bunch of photographs that describe the existing context of, of the historic city. And then they've kind of brought in a series of images, models, and other watercolors and stuff like that that show a new architectural style that complements that. And, you know, it's, it's probably less kind of formulated here than kind of found elsewhere. Um, does this building on the right look familiar? And it looks like this place a little bit, right? Like a kind of crude version of it. This is Isaac Rapp. Uh, and we'll talk about Isaac Rapp in just a little bit. This is his um, building for uh, his, his company store for a coal camp outside of Trinidad in, Colorado, in Southern Colorado. This is really the first Pueblo revival or one of the first. Pueblo Revival buildings in 1908. It precedes the 1912 exhibit. It's kind of um, a serendipitous thing, right? Um, his the guy who owned the coal camp said, you know what, like, um, if we're going to build a store, the train runs in front of it, I want everybody to see it. And I like the church at Acoma, which looked like this at the time. It's kind of fallen into ruin. You make me a warehouse that looks like that? And he did. It's that easy. You know, Rapp was an architect in Trinidad, Colorado. He did a bunch of work in Las Vegas and in Santa Fe in a wide range of revival styles uh, that were popular at the end of the 19th century um, and into the early 20th. So this was just another one, but this one was a little bit more inventive. They show, uh, they show that building and photographs of that building and say, hey, this is a great example. And to Gail's earlier point, you know, this is not Beaux Arts classicism. This is a kind of a little bit of a pastiche of uh, of historical elements uh, in an attempt to forge a new style. Perhaps they love rap because rap has completed this this building in the style that they imagined, and it's different than the other kind of new style that's on the scene in the Southwest Spanish uh, mission revival style, which was gaining currency with the railroads, even at the at the at the Chicago World's Fair. Um, this was different enough. This was like, oh, this is a glimpse of the future. And so we're really going to embrace this. Um, coinciding with the Panama uh, California ex exhibition in 1915, uh, the years leading up to that, Hewitt becomes director of all exhibits for that fair, which celebrates the completion of the Panama Canal. New Mexico's estate. There's the opportunity to have a state building built there. Rap designs it. Does it look familiar? A little bit. Uh, this is still in San Diego and Balboa Park. There's also, uh, on the right, kind of like the midway, a, you know, chicken wire and stucco and wood frame version, a pseudo Pueblo that, you know, brings together members of the Pueblos throughout New Mexico um, and puts them on display in their wares and all that. Maria Martinez is one of the people doing work uh, there at the fair for tourist consumption, familiar? The well, and we'll talk about this today, for early Pueblo Revival style and early Santa Fe style is not very deep. And the number of practitioners is a very short list, at least at the very beginning. Um, so they go back to Isaac Rapp and they ask him to do this building that we're in the Museum of New Mexico. Again, it's a refinement. You know, it's, it's certainly a refinement over the Coal Camp building, over the building in, in San Diego. It incorporates an even broader array of uh, references, not only the Acoma Church, but um, churches from several of the different pueblos. Um, building's a little bit more resolved inside. Is it an adobe building? Huh? Do we think that the Coal Camp building was adobe? Probably not. And to be clear, this was not and has never been a church, <laughs> whatever it looks like. Yep. So. And we'll talk about this some more as we walk around today. Isaac Rapp, creator of the Santa Fe style, kind of unacknowledged as such, uh, um, you know, today. We'll talk a lot about his, his architecture today. The name will come up again and again. Um, but he's kind of the, the main player, architect-wise, 
in the uh, early Santa Fe style. Um, we'll talk about some others today. Mary Coulter, American architect and designer, expert practitioner of the Mission Revival and Pueblo Revival styles, among others. Um, her work was very closely associated with the Fred Harvey Company, uh, the hotel company, uh, Santa Fe Railroad, and the National Parks, most notably at Grand Canyon. Um, and she figures very prominently into the history of um, and then, of course, John Gomim comes here in 1920, covering tuberculosis, meets Carlos Vera at the Santa Fe Sanatorium, the Sun Mount Sanatorium that Isaac Rapp designed, and becomes, he's in an immersive Pueblo revival environment, and he becomes infatuated with the Santa Fe style and becomes one of its greatest champions. He also becomes later, talk about some of this, a bit, uh, pro a proponent of architectural regionism in the face of international modernism. This was meant to just be a kind of setup for today, the kind of broad themes. And, and, uh, and you know, my hope is that we could take this mindset of the 1912 new old Santa Fe exhibition and like everything that was, it was thinking about in terms of the future and run with it in our discussion in this room and, and out in the streets. What I'm going to do at, as we kind of sh shut down the preservation or the presentation is, um, is email you uh, a set of images. And this is really a chronological set of images around the style that uh, you can have on your phones as we walk around, uh, and you can look at in more details uh, after the event. Uh, but what we attempted here to do is, is kind of put together a kind of chronology of the evolution, really to, really to highlight a few things that we'll talk about today. You know, the big thing that, you know, is that, you know, it's not invented here. Right, 1904, 1905, Eric Coulter does Hopi House at, at, at Grand Canyon, which is really the earliest example of Pueblo Revival. And it's a, you know, it's a complete environment, it's a complete building, drawing from the ancient Pueblos. The early, the first decade of the 20th century, and Chris Wilson really promotes this idea, you know, it, Santa Fe style was born in Albuquerque. Uh, the UNM president at that time Besides, this is the look of our university. We're doing Pueblo Revival. What's Pueblo Revival? Eh, we're going to make it up. And he gets an architect, this Christie guy, and they go to town. Some of these buildings have been demolished, like the one on the left, 1905, it's really early. Um, but the one on the right still exists. It's a reproduction of, uh, of the Kiva at Santo Domingo, and it's a fraternity house. Um, they also, which is kind of nuts. All right. Uh, they also decapitate this building. This is the first classroom building at, um, at UNM. It has some structural problems. In 1908, they, um, they convert it to uh, the Pueblo Revival style. Dormitories and several other buildings on campus that are done there. It's kind of a short-lived phenomenon. It's not without controversy. It kind of goes away until Mean starts working at UNM again in the 30s. Um, and it's still a debate, you know, what the campus style is at UNM. Um, so that's in here. These buildings are put in context. There's some more Mary Coulter at Grand Canyon. There's Isaac Rapp's um, Gross Kelly um, warehouse at the rail yard, 1913. So right after the new old Santa Fe exhibit. What building is it reference? Acoma. The sanatorium at Sun Mount. This building that we're in, the School for the Deaf, is more or less contemporary with this in a kind of very, very, very similar style. Across the street, over there, the castle building, the El Anate, um, is is built. It's still there. It's been heavily remodeled. Um, the tall park isn't there anymore. Um, I think we know what the reference is. Uh, we're going to go back and look at and, and talk about, while we're there, the, the federal building, which is now IAIA. Um, that's built by 1920-ish. There's also examples here from... Uh, outside of Santa Fe, Mary Coulter's um, Seminole El Navajo Hotel in Gallup, which is down, um, the, the Franciscan Hotel in Albuquerque, which is a kind of really modern interpretation of the Pueblo style. But the point is, is that this is being used elsewhere. There's some slides in here, too, about residential development, Carlos Vera's house, um, the Isaquia Madre house, which we talked about, go by today. Um, I don't want to give short shrift to the territorial revival style, but um, it's kind of an outgrowth of this. And on the left here is uh, Jungle Neves, uh, 1934, um, Villagra building, uh, which is in Guadalupe District. 
kind of early example of that, and then a more or less contemporary example at Los Colonos. Um, and again, Santa Fe style is not exclusive to Santa Fe. We continue to see it being used in the park service, tourist facing, tourist promoting, antiquity promoting, a kind of similar set of, of objectives in, in the tourist focused buildings at the National Park Service. Uh, the one on the right is in town, though, of course, it's where I work. It's the largest Adobe office building um, uh, in the United States. Um, we also put together a, a clickable a bibliography, which you can access in the PDF. That's, that's coming to you as part of this um, talk today.